It's Zo Time. Welcome to the Zo Time Show presented by HoopsandBrews.com. I will be your host for the day, Daniel Belts. And before we start this off, make sure you're following uh, the Zo Time podcast on Twitter, SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, and um, if you're listening to this on Dash Radio on Brews A Nights, thank you for listening. Um, it feels great talking to you guys this uh, on this beautiful Monday. Um, the Lakers had two games this weekend. We had a back-to-back, and we won both of them. Um, and they're not like the greatest teams. We beat the Kings, and also we beat the Hawks. But the holidays are rolling around, and the Lakers are back to winning games. We are 7-6. and six. Uh, We finally have a winning record. It's been, what, two years since the Lakers have had a winning record. That was in uh, 2016. That was the first year of Brandon Ingram's time in L.A., so it's been a while since he's been accustomed to winning Lakers basketball for our young kids like Lonzo, Kuzma, and Hart. This is the first time they've been over 500, so it's a very, very good time to be a Lakers fan. It's a very good time for these young kids to get this experience, and I mean, shit, it's been a long time coming for us Laker fans, right? Like, we've been spoiled the majority of our fandom with the Los Angeles Lakers, and they took a brief five-year hiatus of kind of just living in the moment, tanking with Byron Scott, um, tanking when Luke first came here. We had to deal with Mike D'Antoni before Byron. We had to deal with Mike Brown before Byron, and it's just, or Mike Brown before uh, D'Antoni. It's been a while. We had a uh, Bickerstaff. I think was like three and as a head coach, and they brought in D'Antoni. But man, it's been a while since the Lakers have been competitive. It's been a while since they've had something to play for, and it seems like the Lakers are on their way back to where they should always be. Um, we're the Los Angeles Lakers, who basically have a finals appearance and finals win in every single decade that the NBA has been around. Not a lot of teams can say that. Not any team can say that. Um, Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. Like, the Los Angeles Lakers basically are the cream of the crop franchise. We didn't take 30, 30 years off before we won a title like the Celtics did, who counts all their rings before the... NBA merged with the ABA, um, so not to throw any shade, but the Lakers are the model organization, and even though the Celtics, I guess, have had a better winning record this de- this decade, they still don't have a title this decade. We do. It was in 2010. From 2010 to 2019 is the 2010 decade. We have a ring. They don't. So stop with the, well, the Celtics make the Eastern Conference Finals two years ago. Who gives a shit? If you want to count Conference Finals, be my guess, but that's not what you play the game for. If you don't win your final game of the season after making the playoffs, you're still just a loser, so fuck it. But yeah, enough about the other teams. It just, it feels positive in Lakers land. We're playing ugly, but we're still getting a win. If we played ugly last year, we'd lose by probably 10 to 15 points. This year, we're winning these games. And we still have a bunch of flaws like on our team. It all comes down to X's and O's, rotations, and just inconsistency with some of the young players, which is to be expected. If you look around the league, you will see every young player struggles from time to time with consistency. It's not just the L.A., Lakers players that struggle with consistency. It's the entire young player um, people in the NBA. It's it's fascinating how many times you'll see on first take or undisputed or whatever trash ass sport debate shows around the morning how they always like to basically ridicule and kind of say that the Lakers should trade their young pieces for a proven player when if you looked at some of the stats this year, and I'm just talking about this year, you'd see that the Lakers' young core is doing better than your um, so-called favorite young core in the league, which is the Boston Celtics' young core. And 
I mean, just look at the stats themselves. Um, I'll talk more about this later in the episode when we get to a couple of segments, but national media likes to seem likes to make it seem like the sky is falling with the Lakers' young core when, honestly, they're playing pretty good given the circumstances with Ingram still trying to find his way after getting suspended for four games, with the entire team trying to adjust to playing with LeBron. If you look at all of LeBron's previous teams, it took a while for the other players to get acclimated with playing with him. So it's not just, oh, the L.A. Lakers young core is trash. It has a history and a track record of it taking a while for LeBron and company to figure it out. So just give this Lakers young core a chance. And again, not every win we've had this season is pretty. But I will take a ugly win before I take an amazing loss. If you go online, you'll see like Hawk fans being so happy that they kept it close with the Lakers. You'll see the King fans saying, oh, Deer and Fox outplayed Lonzo. Well, motherfucker, I don't care about individual matchups. This is the NBA. We care about wins. Lonzo's team won. It's all I fucking care about. And if you wanted to look at that, I believe Lonzo Ball had a better plus minus on the court than Fox. So when Fox was on the court, he was not impacting his team in the correct way and I know it's not the greatest thing to look at for plus minus but it just goes to show you when he was on the court his team wasn't winning so fuck out of here with all that dumb shit and you like it's just strange how the opposing fans want to make it Lonzo versus their young player but the Lakers have certain young players that are outplaying their young players while winning the game so it's just funny to see the goalpost move once the Lakers start winning basketball games. But, again, more on that in the future. Um, yeah, it's just... The Lakers aren't where I thought they'd be after 13 games, but at least they're above 500. And I want to give a huge... Probably, like, a huge shout-out to the boys at Hoops and Brews because they predicted that the Lakers would probably go 8-6 and six to start the season, and if the Lakers win their game on Wednesday versus the Blazers... That's going to be exactly the record they have. So they, they've called this for a while. I thought they'd go 11-3 and three after their first 14 games. I'm a Lakers homer. I'm biased. I'm not afraid to admit that. I watch all these Laker games with a purple and gold like glass frame. So I'm going to try to see roses while they'll see shit. So they're probably right on the 8-6 and six record. And they're right about a couple more things about how the Lakers are playing. Make sure you give them a follow. Make sure you check out all the beautiful content that they're pushing out. Go and check out Pavi's interview with um, Derek Rose, which is cool as shit to see this brand go from them getting a couple plays on their like first couple episodes to now they're getting thousands of views on their YouTube page, getting media passes, interviewing a MVP. So it's just dope to see where they've gotten this, like how far they've taken it and... It's only the beginning. I'm excited to be a part of their um, NBA media. I'm very just happy that they've given me this platform to talk about Lakers basketball, and it's just going to keep getting better and better as the months, years go on. And again, like I said, wins. I care about wins more than stats. I care about wins more than moral victories. Also, I want to give a huge shout-out to the Sacramento Kings because they do have very important um they play a very important part in this nba season the celtics own their pick in the more wins the kings get the worse that pick looks for boston so sacramento i meant no disrespect talking shit about De'Aaron fox i hope you guys get the ninth seed in the western conference uh seeding win 38 to 40 games have that pick at number 14 and that'll just be beautiful you guys have a exciting young core I love the jump that Fox made. I even love the jump that Buddy Hill made more. He's almost averaging 50, 40, 80, which is pretty damn good for a 25, 26 year old. I don't know how old Buddy Hill is, but I know he came in the NBA like three or four years um, through college, and then this is his third year. So he's a bit older than what you would consider a young player, but he still made this tremendous leap. And. Yeah, so win as much games as you can besides against the Lakers. 
And like I said, when the Lakers play like other young core players like a Luka, like a Fox, like a Trey, they're all great individual players. I all like what they bring to the table, but those three players all took L's against the Lakers. So I don't need to hear about, oh, would you rather have, um, would you rather have Luka than Lonzo? Fuck no. Lonzo's team won. I'll, I'll ride and die with Lonzo until I see that something needs to happen. This is obviously called the Zotime Show. I am a huge fan of Lonzo, but I'm a huge fan of the Lakers first. I've been a Lakers diehard for many of years. If the correct trade is out there and Lonzo hasn't shown after a couple years that he's going to get to that level, then yes, move on from Lonzo. But I think he's going to get there. I think playing with LeBron takes time to adjust to. And I will talk about more of this later, but last night's game against the Hawks showed a big sign of improvement with Lonzo playing with LeBron. Wins are all that matters. Keep that negative bullshit out of here. I'm tired of Laker fans complaining about Lonzo or Ingram or Kuzma or Hart. They're all very young players. They're going to figure it out. They were all drafted for a particular reason. It's just going to take time understanding how to play with those players with LeBron. Since some of LeBron's skills overlap some of the skills that Ingram and Lonzo have. Last year, it was easy to play them all and have them run the correct system because there wasn't much overlap. We had Kuzma, who's the shooter, Hart, who is a shooter and a finisher, Randall, who plays bully ball, Lonzo, who feeds everybody, and Ingram would be the go-to scorer. Everyone had their role last year, and it was pretty much consistent the entire year. This year, it's a lot different. We're implementing veterans while we're playing the young core. Everyone's trying to get situated. So, yeah. It's going to take time. Also, before we get into the heavy, heavy topics of today, shout out to the man Tyson Chandler. Um, you've been hooping. You've been way better than the so-called hipster Twitter thought you would be in LA. And even if you can't keep this up, the fact that you helped change the outcome of three games this early on in the season while the Lakers still try to figure out what they're doing. It's going to play a huge impact when the playoff seeding comes around in April when the difference between the ninth seed and the three seed is like two games. These three games will make a difference. And even if you only impact these three games, you will have done more for the LA Lakers in three games than you did for the Phoenix Suns for however many years you were stuck in purgatory hell. And that is what I'm going to consider Phoenix as because it's hot as fuck and it's a place where talented players with talented careers go to die. They are the Cleveland Browns of the NFL or of the NBA. And yeah, so it's very early on. Right now the Lakers are in the eighth seed and obviously that's not where we want to see them at with the amount of talent we've added in the offseason with the amount of progress our young core is going to make. But bouncing back from that 0-3 start very, very, very impressed with the last 10 games. They are 7-3 and three in the last 10 games, and outside of that disastrous performance against the Raptors, they've been in every game. Even the first three games that we lost, we were in those games. So 12 out of the 13 games we've played have been competitive, and we've won 7 of them. So again, the actual gameplay might not be pretty, but we're close in every single game. We have a fighter's chance to win all of those games outside of the Raptors. And it seems like the team has the correct mix of patience and kind of, um, what would you call that? They understand that there is a long-term plan, but they're also able to play hard in the moment and try to win these games. It seems like they acknowledge the... Um, what we're trying to do, and also, hey, but we also need to win games while we're trying to do that as well. Like, we're trying to build these players up, but let's not forget, we still got to win these games, so we're playing in April, so we're playing in May. And also, Lakers basketball is in a weird state of affairs. Um, it's almost like a silver war every single night with when the Lakers play. You have the, Laker, the Lakers diehards versus the LeBron fans that jumped over. If 
things aren't going well, you're going to see Lakers and LeBron fans clash. You also have the Lonzo and Rondo fans. You have the Laker fans who understand that Lonzo is probably the point guard of the future and us wanting him to play and close out the game versus the LeBron stands that say Rondo should play because he's this vet that has a ring in Boston. Um, you also have NBA media kind of side with Rondo just because he's, I guess, a proven player. But if you look at the stats, they're honestly not that different. And that's what kind of kills me because Lonzo's a better defender and the stats are kind of the same. So when that happens, I'm going to side with the player that's probably going to be around longer than one year. And that's why I'd rather start Lonzo and finish with Ron uh, Lonzo. But some games I get closing with Rondo, like the Portland Trailblazer game, when he was just outstanding. And for whatever reason, he seems to always play up when he plays Dame and CJ. I don't know if there's some beef between them, but I understand why he sometimes closes. But for the m most part, I don't understand it. Then you also have the Ingram believers and the non-believers. And I didn't realize there were this many people against how Ingram plays the game and just don't believe in his actual talent to be this star one day. When he plays the game correctly, like he did against the Wolves, you can see the glimpses, you can see the flashes. But when he settles for too many mid-range jumpers, you have these non-believers come out there and say he's trash. Then... You have the players or the fans that um, fight over Kuzma and Ingram. Like, which one should start? Then they throw in starting Josh Hart instead of one of them. So there's just a lot of beef going on in Lakers Twitter. It's very weird seeing all of that happen while having a winning record. But it's the Lakers. We have the biggest fan base, and it's going to happen. I can't wait until... Things are smoothed out with the entire like roster and rotation wise and we can just kind of stop beefing with each other and people can stop just clashing with ideas about Lakers basketball because we all want the same thing we all want the Lakers to win while the young core is a big reason why they do it's just we have a difference of opinions on how it should be done and for the most part outside of the whole Lonzo Rondo thing Luke's handling this very well He's dealing with a lot of outside noise, inside noise, different personalities, and hey, we're seven and six, so like I know I'm very harsh on Luke when he doesn't play Lonzo in the fourth, but outside of that, and the whole X's and O's schematics, he handles his team very well, which is why I don't think he needs to go. I just think his assistant coaches need to go, and we need to get more tactical assistant coaches, because I do believe in Braun and the young core. It's just... I believe they need to be put in a system that is going to work for all parties involved instead of just one party involved. And, all right, let's get into the show. It's time for the Wild Lakers hot take portion of this podcast. And, like I said, if they use Lonzo like they did last night against the Atlanta Hawks, this team will be very good. And it might not show it in his usage percentage, but the Lakers probably utilized Lonzo more than they ever had. And that's because they ran more um, Lonzo, LeBron pick and rolls. And last year we tried this with Lonzo and Ingram. And it wasn't that effective. But again, LeBron is in a different tier than all of our current young players. So when we run the pick and roll with LeBron and Lonzo, LeBron demands a lot of, like, uh, a lot of attention from the defense. So when they go to jump to him... LeBron dumped it down to Lonzo, and then Lonzo has a kind of like a two-on-one versus the rim and the defense, right? Because Lonzo's man goes to LeBron, so Lonzo is open. Both men went to guard LeBron, so Lonzo's kind of stuck in the, hey, do I shoot this floater or do I lob it up to a teammate or kick it out for three? And he, right now, is struggling with finishing around the rim, but what he does well is even though when he should be taking the shot, he can still find a pretty pass that'll set up a teammate for a wide open shot. It's crazy because he should be shooting these like five to 10 foot floaters or jumpers, but instead he's 
finding a crease where he can pass it to JaVale for a dunk, or he's finding a crease where he can hit Ingram for a three or Hart for a three. It's very fascinating to watch because even when the defense does what they're supposed to do against Lonzo Ball, he is still able to find the correct pass. His his IQ level is just outstanding. Like there was a there was a play where he went to the rim and Alex Lynn was right there, but he still threw a lob to JaVale. When Alex Lynn was kind of already backing up to guard JaVale, he th- or was it Tyson Chandler? I don't know which big he threw a lob to, but the correct play is finishing it. But he still found the correct pass to make, and it still resulted in the Lakers' basket. And so far this season, per 100 possessions, Lonzo's offensive and defensive rating is the exact same. It's 110, so it's basically even, and... If you look at the individual games, his rating, like, between the offense and defense is either really fucking good or it's just terrible. Like, there are some games where it's, like, 148 for offensive rating, then there are some games where it's 62. So it's what a young player does. Very inconsistent, big highs and big lows. And if you've looked at Jason Tatum's last couple games, you would see some huge lows as well, but for whatever reason... Lonzo is the only one that gets thrown under the bus time and time again, as well as Ingram. And again, like I said, in the pick and roll situation, use Lonzo as a screener. He is a good screener. He had, what, four screen assists against the Hawks? And I believe this was um, Alex Regla on Twitter who um, pointed this out. He is a good screener. Most of LeBron's threes against the Hawks came with Lonzo screening. His added strength to his upper body helps. Um, The NBA not knowing what a moving screen also helps. Because one of them, at least in my opinion, was a moving screen. They didn't call it. But it is what it is. If the refs aren't going to call that shit, take advantage of horrific officiating. It's alright to cheat. If if you're not cheating, you're not trying. If the refs aren't going to fucking call it, do it. And then... So not only did they use him correct in with screening, he also was able to find um, players at the correct position. And even though he's missing layups, jumpers, floaters, he's at least trying them. Like, he's trying to keep the defense honest. He tried the um, running floater from the left side of the court to bounce it off the backboard, which I definitely knew was not going in, but it almost went in, and at least he's trying it. He's also pulling up from mid-range, which his shot definitely does look different when he pulls up from the mid-range, and that was noted last year, but he's at least trying this stuff. What I respect out of Lonzo is, hey, it might not go in, but at least he's shooting these things. If you look at the Philadelphia 76ers play, they don't try to go outside of their comfort zone. Lonzo will go outside of his comfort zone at times. Like if you look at Philadelphia, Fultz and Simmons won't shoot a three. Hell, they won't even shoot like an 18-footer. It's very strange that they're not at least attempting one or two. When defense, the defense they face lets them. They're like, here, shoot it, motherfucker. But with Lonzo, he still takes that shot, and that's why... Hey, he might not be able to do things well, but I respect him for at least trying. And if you had told me out of the four, which includes Tatum, Brown, Ingram, and Lonzo, that Lonzo has the highest effective field goal percentage out of the bunch, I would say that's crazy considering what people are saying about Lonzo. But he has the highest out of them all. And he has a second highest three-point rating behind Tatum at 36.2%. Which, if he can keep that up the entire year, that would be amazing. He shot 30% from the three-point line last year. That's already a 6% increase. And he's only, what, 21? So then you can keep improving after that. We just need a way better fucking foundation than 30% last year. And then he also has the highest amount of steals and assist out of that bunch with the second lowest turnover. So it's just very interesting when you just look at the grand scheme of things. You see Lonzo and Ingram get a bunch of backlash. And I believe Ingram is the second in efficiency from the uh, field goal stat, as well as 
second or first in field goal percentage. Brown and Tatum are struggling shooting the ball, yet you only hear it when it happens in L.A. Because they are infatuated with what the Celtics did in the playoffs last year, which, hey, you do it in the East, nah, like I'm, it's not that impressive to me. Kind of like that meme with that guy, that girl's beautiful to me, whatever. And it's just, it's funny that this young Laker duo has a higher field goal percentage than the Celtics young duo has. But you only hear, hey, the Lakers gotta trade Brandon Ingram. Hey, the Lakers gotta trade Lonzo Ball. It's not working. Look at the fucking record, dipshits. They're both 7-6. and six. So the Celtic fans were like, hey, <laughs> yeah, they might be having better stats than these players right now, but my young core does it and wins. Well, guess what, motherfucker? Mine does as well. Let's not even forget, Kuzma's having the best season out of all players mentioned. And I'm not even giving him shine right now. Kuzma's averaging the most points, shooting the best field goal percentage. So it's not even that Lonzo and Ingram are having probably better statistical years than Tatum and Brown. Kuzma probably is as well. Don't even get me started on a Josh Hart, who is probably having the best statistical out of the six mentioned above. So yes, I am very excited about this current young core, but if he turned on ESPN, if he turned on Fox Sports 1, if he turned on to Jason Whitelock, you would hear that the, it seems like the Lakers are in hell right now with the whole state of California on fire, but yet keep that same energy when other young cores struggle. Because, hey, Tatum was on the bench during the start of the second half versus, what, the Suns? Hey, Tatum wasn't closing that game either. So shit, if you're going to make a huge spotlight out of Lonzo, just keep that same energy with other players. Because, hey, Fultz doesn't start second halves. Fultz doesn't close. Keep it consistent. I don't even think Josh Jackson starts in Phoenix, and they're a fucking dumpster fire. So while Lonzo still has his flaws, when utilized correctly, it's clear as day he makes a difference. When they get stops and they allow him to run in transition, he and Braun are amazing. That uh, half-court alley-oop that Lonzo threw to LeBron was beautiful. And it seemed like LeBron let Lonzo kind of initiate some of the offense versus the Hawks. Their plus-minus in that game was amazing. Their offensive and defensive rating in that game was amazing. And a couple of people want to say, hey, well, Lonzo got cooked by Trey Young a couple of plays. If someone is shooting 31-foot jumpers right next to the L in Lakers and Lonzo at least still had a hand up, you know what? You got to just say, hey, Trey Young, amazing shot. Because nine times out of ten, I will allow the uh, opponent to shoot that shot outside of Steph Curry. You got to guard Steph Curry from everywhere. And again, when Lonzo's three-point shot is falling, his game is amazing because it gives him this added confidence to do everything else. He still seems to be getting it in game shape, and he dealt with, sorry about that, he dealt with the ankle injury, but guess what? He dealt with it. He played through it. He didn't duck De'Aaron Fox. He beat the team. It's a big sign of confidence this year with our training staff. They allowed Ingram and Lonzo to both play through um, tweaking the ankle a bit, and now I just want to see Lonzo do whatever it takes to finish games. Make it... 100% clear that you should be finishing these games like I thought you did against the Hawks. But at least he didn't put in Rondo. He put in Hart, who Hart was playing fantastic that game as well. So that's my whole Lonzo Ball like spiel for the day. Let's get into the LeBron James portion of this podcast, which is the King era in Staples. And Bron, I was very critical of you last week with not you with you not being able to close out games and Hey, even if this week wasn't pretty, you still got the job done. You're still the leader of this Lakers team, and they went 3-0. Yeah, you might have missed some free throws against the Hawks, but you still had the game, or the go-ahead basket to win that game. So if you would have missed those free throws, shit would have been dire out here for you. But you did what a good leader does, and you made up for your mistake, and hey, we won the game. We went 3-0 this week. It's hard to critique you, LeBron, when we went 3-0. You are our leading scorer in all of them. You're actually playing... You played pretty good defense this week as well. It was a... 
honestly, it was a good week for you, LeBron. We went to seven and six. Um, also, you're using certain moments to teach Ingram some stuff and Kuzma as well. You have this beautiful connection with Lonzo as of recent with um, like on the offensive end and defense as well. You and Kuzma seem to feed off each other offensively. A lot of your, I, I want to say probably 40% of your assists this year have come to Kyle Kuzma. He cuts, you find him, you throw some of the p- prettiest passes I've ever seen. But you also have some dumbass turnovers. But hey, at least you're trying. And you're taking too many threes for my liking, but you have raised your percent this week. I don't know if I want to see a game where LeBron shoots nine threes. But if you make three of them, hey, go for it. Um, I still think you're settling too much for threes when you're met when you have a mismatch, and um, it was my father who noticed that whenever you are going to shoot a step back three, you look at the ground, and it's just strange. Like you look at the ground to make sure you're um, set up correctly, and it's funny because after he said that, I started to watch the rest of the Hawks games like that. I'm like, hey, let's see if when LeBron looks at the ground let's see if he's going to pull up from three and i want to say 80 percent of the time you did but hey it is what it is we're three no this week you're still learning how to play with this team and you're still averaging pretty good um, a pretty good stat line so just don't crack like you said you were going to crack um you had some recent interview where it seems like the early season struggles got to you but didn't your team struggle in Miami and Cleveland? So, it's another much ado about nothing. Let's just get another Lakers hate piece out there. And that's what they that's what they do. We're used to it in LA. But now it gets more attention with... Hey, it also involves LeBron. So more of the world has to see that shit. But it is what it is, man. You're going to lead this young Lakers team to the playoffs. You are still a monster on the NBA court. Even though... We can definitely tell you're 33 going on the 34. Um, whether it's your hair, the gray in your beard, or the fact that you can't physically dominate the game like you used to, because we still haven't seen this like 40 point triple double and a win. We've seen you get close to it, but you haven't taken over like you did in Cleveland last year. And I expect once the season probably hits the midway point when we're fi- fighting for a playoff seating. I probably think you go ape shit over there like Kobe did in 2012-2013. So if we're seven and six right now and you're kind of taking a back seat to kind of allow others to figure out figure it out, I get it. And hey, it's kind of working. We're slowly but surely turning this thing around to get it to where the kind of um how would you call it? The kind of execution you're looking for. It definitely seems like you love the Tyson Chandler addition you all you guys already have that chemistry with playing each other playing with each other on the team usa teams it seems like you called in a favor with james jones to release them so just thank you for coming to la man um and let's just get these w's now it's time for the big shit popping and little shit stopping portion of this podcast and for little shit today very little it's very hard to find things to complain about when you go three and oh during the week and This first one's not even about the Lakers team. It's about some Laker fans. Fuck all the fans that already gave up on certain young core players. Like, just stop watching. And I don't think it. I don't think they're actual Laker fans because us Laker fans love what the young core brings. I think it's the bandwagon fans that joined this year. The young core is still adapting to playing with LeBron. Give them time. That's all I gotta say about that rotations i still don't understand the rondo love story that luke has with rondo i don't think i'll ever get it but hey if it if we win those games i'm not going to complain about it much because i'd rather have a win than a loss and hey if rondo helps in any way go for it i just want to see the lakers win a game and also lakers execution late and fourth is a disaster if we were able to properly close out teams, I would want to say half of our wins wouldn't have come down to the wire like they have. But it is what it is. We'll figure it out eventually. We're only still, what, 13 games into the season? There's still 70 more games for us to figure it out. 
and if everyone stays healthy, they're going to have practice time to figure that out. So this train will get on the correct course probably around December. We'll probably go on some fantastic run, like 12-1 and 1 during the month of December or some shit like that. And that's just a wild prediction, but hey, once we figure out how to close games, once we figure out rotations, and once a young core shows consistency, look out, because this team will be very freaking difficult to deal with. Now it's time for the big shit popping portion, and hey, we went 3-0 this week. We got back above 500, that's all that matters. I don't care if we won by 100 or if we won by one point. We went 3-0. Um... And also, the schedule is easy this week, too. Outside of the Blazer game, we have the Magic and Heat. What the Lakers have to do is they have to have at least a 70 to 80% win percentage against the Eastern Conference. And we play the Magic and Heat. That should be two easy Ws. And we've already beaten the Blazers in Portland. And also, we play them at home this week. So we'll see what happens against that but I would love to see another 3-0 week to have us on a six game win streak more about that schedule prediction later in the show when I get to my prediction portion of the podcast and also Brendan Ingram played fantastic versus the Minnesota Timberwolves in the second half if he can duplicate that second half every night he will be the player we all think he's going to become he was taking threes in rhythm he wasn't Overly shooting from the mid-range, which is not the most uh, analytically loved shot, but the ones he did take went in. He also played amazing defense. For all of Ingram's offensive woes this season, if you look outside of that Houston game, Ingram, for the most part, plays fantastic defense. And yes, he did get sort of cooked, if you want to call it, against Trey Young at the end of the game, but Trey Young still missed it. It got blocked. So... If hey, if you get cooked and the shot still didn't go in, you didn't get cooked. The dude just made a nice play. That it's what a million dollar move to ten cent finish. That's Trey Young. And the last, um, actually not the last part of it, but the second to last bullet point of the big shit popping portion is Kyle Kuzma. Offensively this season he's been a monster, and like I said with regards to the young core. Kuzma's averaging 18.5 points per game, and I believe 5 rebounds, and I believe 48% from the field. He still isn't shooting fantastically from 3, but he's probably been our most consistent young player on the team. And maybe 3rd overall. And he's just been fantastic every game. You know, every single game, he's probably going to get close to 20 points. He's not going to let LeBron do it all on his own. He's going to help him out. He's going to get 18. And some of the shots he finds, like, he is just an excellent cutter. He also has a, in recent games, his he's increased his three-point percentage. He doesn't take as much dickhead shots, as I like to call them, as he did last year. And I'll explain what dickhead shots are. They're kind of just like... They're not heat checks because he wouldn't be on... F- I don't mind a heat check, but when it's a it's a dickhead shot when you shoot a heat check shot when you're not on fire. Like when you're just pulling up with 20 seconds left on the shot clock, like from three, like from 28 feet, a shot you shouldn't be taking. Or when you try like a running hook shot from like 14 feet. Like I... Some shots he still takes that are still just head scratchers, but he's taken less and less amount of dickhead shots this season. He lets the game come to him on the offensive side of the ball, and he has been fantastic this season. And he definitely deserves to start. We have probably six players that deserves to start. So it's... Luke definitely does have a tough job with starting certain players because I think Josh Hart has done enough to start as well. I think Lonzo's done enough to start, Ingram's done enough, obviously LeBron, obviously JaVale. So we have six players that deserve to start. And then the last portion of this would be the defense. We have gotten a lot better on the defensive side of the ball. And whether it's we face some teams that just struggle this season, like the Hawks, like the Kings, I don't care. 
we still held the Kings to under 100 points. And honestly, that's all that matters. We're going to be a team that struggles probably on the defensive side of the ball the entire year. We might not ever get to top 10 for the defensive side of the ball, but at least if we're in the 15 to 16 range, that's fine because our offense is going to carry us. Now let's get to the player segment portion podcast or of the podcast, and that's going to be Tyson Chandler is a difference maker still. I cannot believe at the age of 36 he's made this much of an impact already. And again, it might only just be a certain amount of time because, yes, he is old. Yes, it's very hard probably for a center to exert that much energy at the age of 36, but Suns fans said he wouldn't be anything. Hipster Twitter said he was washed. They said he'd hurt our team instead of helping. And again, fuck it. Even if it's only those three games, they're three. there's still three wins. And it'll matter when the playoffs happen. And he's had such a positive impact on this team. Against the Minnesota Timberwolves, he made Carl Anthony Towns his bitch. Like, it wasn't even pretty for Cat. You saw that highlight of Cat trying to back him down, and then he couldn't, and then he gave his little bitch face after. And I believe Cat was like 5 of 17. Um, Derek Rose did enough to win that game. Jimmy Butler did enough to win that game, but Cat let him down. And now Jimmy Butler's on a different team. But again, Carl Anthony Towns, or not Carl Anthony, Tyson Chandler showed his impact. He also had some impressive fourth quarter offensive rebounds against the Timberwolves that saved us because we weren't able to shoot for shit in the final two minutes. But guess what? Sometimes when you have a lead, all you need to do is run out the clock. And that's what the Lakers did with the offensive rebounds that Tyson Chandler provided us because we miss after miss after miss and all Tyson did was just tap it out, tap it out, tap it out. We won that game due to his presence which is kind of alarming, but hey, it is what it is. We shouldn't need him to make that much of a difference, but the fact that he can make that much of a difference just shows how misused he was in Phoenix, how terrible that franchise is. Um, Year after year, you hear hipster Twitter say, hey, this might be the year the Phoenix Suns make the playoffs. What happens every, every year? They are fucking terrible. They want to say, hey, Devin Booker is this great player, but... Does the way Devin Booker play lead to wins? I don't think so. Unless you're watching a different... Unless the results are a different result. I don't see it in Phoenix. And it might be because the Suns don't have a point guard, but that's sort of the Phoenix Suns' fault, right? They drafted Josh Jackson over De'Aaron Fox. Imagine what would have happened if you gave Devin Booker De'Aaron Fox. Things might look a little bit different in Phoenix. And then against the Sacramento Kings... He made Willie Cauley-Stein his bitch, who Willie Cauley-Stein has played very well this season. Like, the jump that he made, and it might just be because it's a contract year for him, but the jump he made this season is fantastic. Like, he's playing very good for what he is. And Tyson Chandler made it very difficult for him. He got him in foul trouble. He got him to turn the ball over. He got him to take stupid shots in that game. Um, and Tyson Chandler also got 12 boards that game. He was a presence to be dealt with on the offensive glass and defensive glass. And he's not going to score that much. He's going to shoot terrible probably from the field and the free throw line. But again, there's more to NBA games than scoring. Tyson Chandler shows that. And it's just amazing how many people don't realize that there's more to the NBA than scoring. Everyone's obsessed with scoring because scoring is up in the league. But at times, you're going to need a defensive stop. You're going to need an offensive rebound. You're going to need a hard screen set. Everything that Tyson Chandler provides. And versus the Atlanta Hawks, we all know what he did. That block against Trey Young, which was borderline goaltending, but the NBA officials have said, no, that was not goaltending. That block against Trey Young saved the game. That is, a, that is a win that we probably wouldn't have had if it wasn't Tyson Chandler down low. It's a win we should have won because we were up 19 points in the third quarter when LeBron and Lonzo were playing very well together, and Kuzma as well, and Josh Hart as well. So it's a game we shouldn't have even been close to to start with, but since we suck in the fourth quarter, we needed a block from Tyson Chandler, and big balls Tyson Chandler stepped up. What Tyson Chandler has is a 
championship pedigree with the Dallas Mavericks. He's always been well-liked and well-respected from all of his teammates. He's been on Team USA, won a gold medal with LeBron. And so he's just this guy that you never hear anything negative regards to coaching. Uh, people in Phoenix question his effort, but hey, you put me in Phoenix, you make me play for a franchise that's just trash, I'll probably not play as well as I should as well. Um, those years in Phoenix were a paid vacation. That's all I want to say about Tyson Chandler's years in Phoenix. Phoenix is where players go to die. And that's just how it is. Ryan Anderson's probably going to end his career in Phoenix. Dragon Bender, who probably won't ever be anything in the NBA because he's just terrible, will probably end his career in Phoenix. Um... Like, even Phoenix fumbled the bag with Drag with Drogic, Isaiah Thomas, and, what, Brandon Knight? I think they kept, no, they kept Bledsoe. They kept the least talented player of them all. The Suns just happened to fumble everything. But that's just what the Phoenix Suns do. And, again, once we signed Tyson Chandler, it kind of felt like our roster was at complete for the moment. He's better than Zubak. He's better than Jay Will. And... It's just nice to see him playing again, getting 20 minutes per game, making an impact. Thanks to James Jones for letting him go. Thanks to Tyson Chandler for stealth tanking to where you weren't needed to be traded for. You can just have been bought out. So that's huge. Getting Tyson Chandler to just join for free instead of trading for him is a very... Just very, very big um, acquisition for free. We didn't have to give up a second round pick or a first round pick or a young player. And I'm not sure how long he'll be able to keep this up, but he's definitely a difference maker. And hopefully, once Mo Wagner gets up with the starters or the bench players with the Los Angeles Lakers, because I know he's playing in South Bay right now, hopefully he can help Mo with just situational defense, because Mo Wagner will never be a great defender. But I feel like Tyson Chandler can help set him up to play great situational defense and I think Mo is going to have a big career with us after this year I feel like this will be like his sort of red shirt year with the Lakers and I just feel like Tyson Chandler can do so many wonders for most of our young bigs maybe he can help Kuzma play situational defense maybe he'll help um, Ingram learn how to play bigger as well and since Josh Hart who is the next player segment I'm going to do maybe he can teach him more of what it takes to be a low post defender and just again thank you Tyson for joining the Los Angeles Lakers because those three wins we do not get without you now let's go to the next player of the player segment portion and that's Josh Hart aka the Rain Man aka Dwight Schrute aka Jim Halpert whatever you want to be called from the office we all know that's your favorite show but the three point marks in which Josh Hart is is he's shooting 43.5% from deep and it should be a lot better because Remember when I said Kyle Kuzma takes a lot of dickhead shots? That's what Josh Hart does sometimes in transition or when he gets the ball from three. He takes a lot of off-balanced three-point shots that he doesn't make a lot of. But when he's standing straight, going straight up with it, and not, like, leaning, he's probably shooting over 50% from three in those regards. And that is amazing. Once he cleans up his shot selection, don't be surprised when it gets close to 50%. One of the better things about Josh Hart is if we do decide to go small, he's probably, out of Ingram, Kuzma, and Josh, he's probably the best low post defender, so he can guard a four. He can, at times, be stuck on a five. He's just so damn strong. He's not able, he's not going to let you get to the exact position you want. Yes, you'll have the height advantage over him, but He's going to do whatever it takes to get you to fade away and not get to your spot because he can handle the contact down low. And it's something else that Laker fans have noticed. He gets a steal and score almost every game. It's like he gets a pick six at least once a game. He steals a pass and he goes all the way and finishes in transition. One of Josh Hart's best qualities on the NBA court is his ability to finish in transition or through contact. This might be why Josh Hart also never gets foul calls is because he can finish this. 
but he needs to start getting whistles because he definitely is the player on our team besides LeBron that goes through contact the most and tries to finish around the rim. So hopefully when he gets these free throws, he also knocks him down. But in his last three games, Josh Hart is 10 of 21 from the three-point line. That's 47.6% from three. That is incredible. He's making a ton. He's obviously making a difference on our Lakers team. And he's going to probably be a key piece for the future since he's on a cheap contract. He's definitely showing that he can play with anyone. He is way better than what I think we all thought he would be when he came out of Villanova. He definitely should not have been the 30th pick, but hey, he fell to us. Just one little critique on Josh Hart is he needs to work on his perimeter defense, and that's probably the only thing slowing him down because he is a good low post defender. He can play the passing lanes very well, but he cheats a lot trying to get the steal, and when that happens, you open yourself up to someone cutting, and his man will score off of that, or he doesn't have the greatest technique to close out, so the guy that he's going to close out on drives right past him. So once he cleans up some of his perimeter defensive play, hell, he might start at some point. I know Luke decided to finish the game with him over Lonzo last game, which I don't... Um, how would you say that? I don't agree with it, but at least it's Josh Hart who can play defense at times on the perimeter instead of Rondo who can't. And I think maybe he did this because he realized LeBron didn't want to bang down low, so he just put in Josh Hart, who can. So there are certain ways to where we can give LeBron a break on not banging down low because it's clear that LeBron doesn't want to be the um, small ball five. And that's okay because LeBron does everything else on offense and has actually played better defense. But we close the game with Tyson Chandler, LeBron, and Josh. Tyson... Obviously, he's going to be our low post presence. And then Josh Hart can as well. So it kind of gave LeBron some breathing room on that side of the ball. And, hey, it worked. We got the win. And I'm just very excited for Josh because he and Kuzma have gotten the best out of their opportunity and they're showing they can make an impact. And, again, when we talk about young core, it's not just Lonzo Ingram and Kuz. It's definitely Josh Hart. He has done enough to put himself in that category with all three of them. So when they speak about young core, it's not just those three. It's Josh Hart, the rain man. And he's definitely outpay, outplayed his pick selection. And it'll be interesting to see once a trade deadline comes around because the Lakers might be active at the deadline because Jimmy Butler was just traded to the 76ers. The amount of all-stars that have a chance to come to L.A. are dwindling next season, so we might take a shot like how the Thunder did with Paul George, the Raptors did with Kawhi, and the Sixers did with Jimmy. We might have to trade for an all-star that's expiring to convince him to stay and sign with the Lakers long-term. I believe in any trade Josh Hart will be involved in because... Sorry about that. His production and his salary are teams that are a thing that any team would want. He's a cheap contract and a very good NBA player. So I feel like teams would want him as a throw in in a trade to sweeten the deal for them. But I don't want Josh Hart traded at all. I want him to finish his. I want all the young players to finish their career in LA just because I do love what the young core brings to the table. And now it's time for prediction time. Last week, I went one out of three, which is not good. I am a probably terrible predictor, so if you do listen to this and make bets with certain pe- or with your friends, or if you actually try betting on some of this for, like, for real, I wouldn't take my predictions as anything more than just a Lakers biased fan. So the prediction I was right on last week was we did play better defense. I was right on that. We held the Kings to under 100 points. For the most part, for the first three and a half quarters against the Hawks, we held them to kind of a shitty shooting night. And yeah, I also predicted LeBron would score at least 40 once last week. That was wrong. I predicted Lonzo would score at least 18 in the game last week. That was wrong. So again, I'm not the best at the shit, but I will keep going. I will keep trying. and I will still 
tell you my predictions, even though the chances of these being right are not... I don't think it'll ever happen. I'm like that Las Vegas gambler that thinks he's going to win every single time he rolls a dice, even if I've lost 20 straight. I always say, hey, well, next time will be different, but it's just not going to happen. But we do have um, three games this week, and instead of individual stat lines this week, I'm just going to predict the games. And we have three games this week, one against the Blazers at home, which I definitely think we will win. Um... I think we're going to try and start a streak against the Blazers like they had against us. They beat us 16 straight times. I think we're going to try to at least get a 5-6 to six game win streak against them this season and the next. I think LeBron, I think the whole Lakers team realizes they let the first game against Portland slip away. And Rondo will probably play very well this game. And... Shooters always shoot better at home, so I expect Hart, Kuzma, and Lonzo to shoot very good from three at this game. I expect Ingram to have a big bounce-back game because after the Wolves game, he didn't play well this weekend. I think this will be his kind of, not not a statement game because he's not going to score 40, but I just feel like he's going to have an efficient game against the Blazers. He's going to do what it takes to help lead us to the win. We also play the Magics in Or the Magic in Orlando. There's no reason why we should lose to the Orlando Magic, who are playing well this season, given their record. Um, from the early goings, it doesn't seem like a lot of tanking teams are actually trying to tank outside of the Phoenix Suns. It seems like these tanking teams are trying to compete early. And the um, Cavs, who are also just straight garbage without LeBron. LeBron left, and they can barely win a game. So it should go to show you the talent the what the Cavs media made it seem like the Cavs had this amazing talent yet without Braun they're borderline a college basketball team and I know Kevin Love is out as well but you have Double T you have um, George Hill you have Jordan Clarkson you have Larry Nance you have these players still playing yet you've only won what you've only won one game you're looking like the 20, what, 13 Philadelphia 76ers and they only won 10 games. And so, yes, we're going to beat the Magic. And then we play the Heat in Miami, I believe. And um, who was it? I don't remember who I was talking to, but they said that LeBron hasn't beat the Heat since he joined them. Like in 2011. So, I don't know if that's still is true, but I just believe LeBron's going to have a very, very good game in his old building he's gonna kind of play to the crowd he's gonna probably get a triple double that game he's gonna lead us in scoring he's gonna lead us to a victory it'll be good to see him play against d wade because they are best friends and they do have this chemistry together but the lakers will go 3-0 this week putting us at 10 and 6 meaning we would be on a six game win streak so my predictions are www and we will be 10-6 and six at the 16-game mark, which is pretty good. Meaning, for Laker fans, that should mean something. We haven't had a above 500 record after a 20-game mark since 2012-2013. That's five years. So if we can get to three wins in a row, putting us at 10, that will at least guarantee us that we're at 500. So then we would just need one win in the final four games during the 20 game stretch to be above 500. And if we're at least 11 and nine by the time 20 games rolls around, that's great because like I said, LeBron James teams struggle early in the year. So if we're able to be above 500 early in the year, once he goes Super Saiyan, once the Lakers young core gets consistent, once Luke figures out rotations, we're gonna go on a stretch where we just annihilate teams. And this has been Daniel Belts. Thanks again for listening on whatever platform you're listening to this on. Um, hit me up on Twitter to discuss Lakers basketball at Zotime Podcast. Um, you can DM me, or you can just like comment on a random tweet. As long as you're not a dick, I will always talk shop with all of you. It's always fun talking Lakers basketball with anyone that can and anyone that has the smarts too. It's often very disheartening trying to talk basketball with people that just don't understand it, that just look at box scores. And... Until the next time that I do this every Monday night, um, 
Let's hope and let's just pray that this Lakers train keeps rolling. Let's carry this win streak on until at least Thanksgiving. Be safe, happy holidays, and go Lakers.